Yes, everybody's with us. So our next panel discussion's title is The Legacy of Robert Wilson. So yeah, welcome everybody here on Zoom um, to the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Center for the third day of the conference in New York City. Tomorrow we will go for the afternoon to Watermill Center itself, visit the archive, visit Bob and see the landscape. Um, all that it's been a, a tremendous journey over those three days and I think it gave us a real insight um, of the universe, of the multiverse um, of Bob's uh, work and I hope that our conference matches that uh, the, the, the largeness, the body um, of work, um, as Susan Sontag said, about every great artist you know, can be recognized by the enormous body of his hair or their works. And we have with us now a very significant scholars um, of theater, and um, this is the final um, discussion here, the final uh, of 30, 35 talks, and it is about really about the legacy, and this is the, really in the center of this conference. Someone said, I think it was Sasha Goldman, uh, what he liked about the conference. It's not about Bob Wilson, it's around uh, Bob, uh, Bob Wilson. So um, now we will um, uh, talk a little bit. What is and will be the legacy? What it already is there and what will be and perhaps what has been. And we welcome Bonnie Moranka, Mark Robinson, Tadashi Ocino, Markus Wessendorf, and of course Maria Shevtsova. Um, Maybe I'll give everybody one or two lines to introduce yourself, themselves very far. We especially welcome Tadashi Uchino. I think it's 5.30 in the morning in Japan. So um, thank you for uh, being with us. Bonnie, um, uh, one or few words, uh, who you are and what you do. Hi. Um, well, uh, I uh, am the editor and publisher of PAJ, a journal of performance and art and PAJ publications. And uh, I've written and edited a number of uh, uh, collections of my essays on the arts and also um, on uh, and anthologies of plays or, or of essays and interviews. Fantastic. Thank you. Over 50 years, an incredible history. Mark? Uh, hi, I'm Mark Robinson. I'm the Dean of Humanities and a professor of English and Theatre and Performance Studies at Yale. Um, I write about American theatre and drama um, broadly, um, and I most recently edited the Library of America edition of Adrian Kennedy's plays. Fantastic. Tadashi. Hi, um, I'm a professor of English and Performance Studies at the Gakushu Women's uh, College. I am also the uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Tokyo, and working on both on Japanese and on the American side and and also some on uh, Reggie's theater uh, in, in, in Germany. I, I just came back from Berlin on uh, the sabbatical for a year. And uh, uh, anyway, I, have, I'm, I mentioned it in, in my paper that I was I just got an offer to buy, write a monograph on Robert Wilson. Sorry that it's in Japanese, but it is very significant that his, um, his work is not too well known uh, here yeah. in Japan somehow. And, and yeah, so uh, the, my, the my, the mic is, the book is coming yeah, in. For the introduction, um, Maria? Hi, everybody. Sorry I was a few minutes late. I was busy listening to the other session on archives. <laughs> so I didn't quite, you know, make it immediately, but I'm here. I'm an emeritus professor of theatre, uh, editor of New Theatre Quarterly for 25 years, sole editor for five, sole editor of it for five since the death of my co-editor five years ago in the major, major world journal on theatre where I published a marvellous uh, talk conversation, COVID conversation, I called it, with, with Robert Wilson. Mm. Well, my second edition book on Wilson is probably asking for a third one now, but I don't know whether the publisher will take a third. You know, people are a bit mean, mean with money these days. And uh, I do a lot of kind of... Um, public work in theatre. I, I speak lectures at festivals, I give presentations, I talk with, with I interview directors um, at these festivals and for massive audiences of like 400 people. Not They're not sort of small symposia. And yeah. um, um, that's probably as much as I can manage to say about Thank you, that. thank you so much. Editor of the Rutledge book, also and writer of uh, Bob Wilson, Marcus. Uh, I'm Markus Wessendorf. I'm the chair of the Department of Theatre and Dance at the University of uh, Hawaii at Manoan, Honolulu. Uh, I've been the editor of the International Brecht Yearbook since 2018, and I am the president of the International Brecht Society. 
Um, uh, Mark, maybe um, we'll start uh, with you. As far as we know, you're, you're working also on a book, 1974. I think you you include uh, the the that uh, landmark production in New York theater, American theater, and also world theater, Einstein on the Beach. Mark, uh, when you hear uh, about Bob and his work and his legacy, what comes to your mind? Yeah, um, so then thank you for mentioning the book. Yeah, it's about uh, 1976, and it takes um, five productions that happened to open that year. And of course, Einstein um, is probably the best known of those five. Um, and uh, in the process of kind of digging into the 76 premiere production, uh, of the work, I found myself um, kind of attending to aspects of Wilson's aesthetics that have, um, over the last decades, been um, either submerged or polished out of view or or just overlooked. And it seemed um, important to recover them so that we have the fullest sense of what his legacy is. Um, and I'll just mention three of those, three or four of those. Um, one is that, you know, rather than only emphasizing Wilson's virtuosity, um, which is profound, um, there is, at least in the 76 production, um, the constant threat, which is quite expressive on its own terms, uh, or the proximity to error. Um, uh, just on a very fundamental level, it was, a, you know, the first production of the opera and lots of things were perhaps not as polished as they would come to be. Um, in retrospect, actually seeing things like a dancer wobbling or getting dizzy or the performer holding the conch shell teetering rather than and having a hard time maintaining her balance, all of these so-called flaws or imperfections um, um, restored a sense of fallibility to the theatrical landscape that we were seeing. Um, and as a result, restored um, or underscored the humanity of the work. Um, and that would be the other, you know, very um, important aspect of his legacy, a new way at the time for theatricalizing that humanity. So rather than just impersonal figures or sculptural presences or reflective surfaces of the performers. Um, we were um, invited to think about character, presence, um, performer um, in a much uh, richer way. Um, it's an honor actually to be on this panel with Bonnie and Maria, um, whose writings in very different contexts on gesture have uh, influenced my own. And I think it is in the gesture, particularly of the hand, um, that you see that humanity really coming through um, mm -hmm. in Einstein uh, most fully. And then the last thing I'd say is, um, and it does connect also to gesture or the hand, um, that the hand is um, capable of great aggression uh, in Einstein, uh, considerable violence. It's an opera that's actually shot through with various forms of violence, not just um, the nuclear blast or Patty Hearst, but various more targeted, smaller forms um, of violation. Uh, and it's it seems, again, important as we uh, often kind of habitually think about Wilson's grace uh, or the decorum of his uh, of his theater to be uh, recalled to the fact that um, there is always the potential for rupture uh, and collapse uh, and other forms of violation or failure of that grace uh, and decorum. And the last thing I'll say is there's a wonderful anecdote that Wilson tells in one of the recent books that has come out where um, he remembers going to a production of Madame a Butterfly, Butterfly um, in an outdoor theater at the near the Cincinnati Zoo, and in the midst of hearing the the arias of Puccini, he also can hear the screaming uh, of the animals in the cages, and that kind of juxtaposition, that um, that kind of animal uh, aggression, um, alongside the beautiful lyricism of the opera, seemed to be. Um, encapsulating his aesthetic in a nutshell. Yeah, that is very, very thoughtful. Thank you um, so much.
Mark, uh, for, for your contribution. Maria, um, you wrote uh, the book about Robert Wilson, um, you know, while he was in the midst of creating, and we heard just from Clifford Allen, the archivist, where how hard it is to create an archive with a massive amount of work still being created. You wrote about Left Doden, I know you follow Nushkin. Um, where do you see Bob Wilson and his legacy within world theater? That's, I've been thinking about this for so many years now that I've lost the track, I think. In world theatre, from my point of view, having done the second edition of the Wilson book, having done long, long section of another book on, on Robert Wilson's Sonosphere, which I think is a very important essay from my point of view, again, in terms of my oeuvre, as I see it, about contemporary theatre directors. And I have always placed Robert Wilson in the context of the contemporary theatre directors of Europe. I don't know enough about the Chinese or the Japanese ones to write about them with any kind of confidence. So I would place him certainly with uh, my friend at the uh, Crayova Festival, which I mentioned the other day, where I saw um, the, the um, Sophia uh, production of, of Shakespeare's The Tempest, Robert Wilson's The Tempest. Um, um, you know, he, he, he is one of these people who had a whole session on, on, on his bian, in his biannual festival on Shakespeare, of Shakespeare. Uh, he had a title called, you know, Great Directors, The Great Directors. Mm. These days, we're very cheery and are very nervous, certainly in Britain, very nervous about using, you know, hierarchies and using grand uh, adjectives like great. But how else do you say something about, how else do you say outstanding? You could say outstanding directors, directors who will live, directors who've made an impact, directors who've had an enormous influence. These are all directors who have all those qualities. So it's the, it's the stature and the lasting power, not just the impact in the moment, but the lasting power of that impact that has been crucial to my research all these years. And I would place Robert Wilson right there, despite the fact that I think he is utterly and totally unique. He is like nobody else. You know, individuals are all unique, but there is unique and unique, and there's a uniqueness that is a kind of one-off uniqueness. I see Wilson there, and that makes his legacy a rather more problematical issue than, say, the legacy of an Ariane Nushkin or of mm -hmm. a Peter Brook. It's a different story. You have to look at it from a different angle, partly because Robert Wilson is really such a multiple talent, multiple artist. All of it, the whole range, is so vast. And I was thinking today, and particularly the like yesterday, everybody's Robert Wilson comes from the point of time and place and space where they have seen his work or have been collaborating with him in a particular point of time and place and space on given works. But the big picture, the whole picture, is so vast. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly, you know, it's vaster than Peter Brooks, for example. And God knows he did 48 of the productions in Paris, and I've seen them all. You yeah. know, so I've been following him as well. But Wilson's outstrips this beyond any kind of a reasonable, how can I put it, energy for one sole individual to start being the living archive of a living archive. Yeah, I think uh, Clifford mentioned 400 productions. And maybe yeah. Max Reinhardt in some way in his transatlantic production, his invention of the Kammerspiel, the chamber place, the outdoor place um, of the, the everyman and his great uh, performances in soccer stadiums and, of course, on German stages. But still, even compared to that, one would say, and I agree with you, it's unique. Uh, Bonnie, before we come to you, uh, Tadashi, um, from a bit a distance, as you also said in your talk today, um, um, how does the world, the Asian world, or just Japan, how does it look at the legacy? Does it have an impact in the thinking of theater makers? Well, it's very difficult because not I I'm not sure how that there are too many people who actually saw his work and and that's one of the reasons why I am writing the book just to see just to tell the people um to look for whatever uh, you know the, the, uh, Bob's work is everywhere in, in Europe whenever you go to Europe you you really have to look up if, if his work is uh, done and you really have to see it live and. It's yeah. unfortunate. Yeah, yeah, it it's very, very unfortunate that the 
it couldn't really afford to invite the uh, larger scale of, of Bob's work. But still, it's a very interesting, as I was saying in my talk, the friendship with Tadashi Suzuki, and, and it's very interesting that Tadashi Suzuki's legacy is now is a, is a problem, although, I mean, you know, he's 84 years old, have six theaters in Toga and everything. But I think it's a compa comparing uh, the Suzuki and, and, and Bob Wilson in, in the book will probably shed some light on, on what Bob has been doing for the last 40 years and, and for the Japanese readers, and especially those who are not necessarily in the theater, but the book is for the, uh, it's, it's, it's the series, it's called the, uh, the 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 the, uh, the figure uh, who who changed the twentieth century the uh, form of forms of knowledge, so he is be treated uh, as one of the innovators of the knowledge in the twentieth century. Although you know uh, we're well into the twenty first century, so those people who are more interested in philosophy uh, uh, and political theory, uh, theory will be interested in uh, the Bob after publishing my book. Thank you um, um, so much, uh, Bonnie. We come to you. And Bonnie, you have been a pioneer um, with your journal. You've been the first to also hint that theater art and performance or performance and art is connected. It is a overlooked perhaps before everybody came, but nobody pointed out that much. You're writing on ecology uh, of theaters mm -hmm. uh, was so significant, the landscapes that also you will talk about tomorrow at Bob's Place. But you also were one of the first to publish about Bob, your book on the theater of images. Um, how do you see Bob's significance within New York and American uh, theater? Well, mm. now or over the decades? Over the decades. It, it's difficult to talk about it right now because theater has moved in other directions that are more political. and um, But the fact is that Bob did so many things uh, before, uh, you know, decades before um, uh, what, what other theater people did. For example, an issue that is important now to people in uh, uh, writing about theater is the whole question of disability. And of course, mm -hmm. Wilson, uh, back in around 74, 75, in the letter for Queen Victoria and other things, um, Christopher Knowles appeared in that, uh, who was diagnosed with autism. Um, also, Bob had um, uh, multiple races of people in his work, something that's not always been um, written about. He had that um, early on. That's another significant factor now. Um, the different sexualities of, of, uh, of the work also uh, appeared you know, um, decades ago, but the, but the thing is that it's it's difficult to, to to you know to say it at every single period what the legacy of a person is or what the influences are. Um, years ago, when people saw more of his work, uh, say at Brooklyn Academy or other places here, it had more of an, uh, more of an influence directly in terms of just looking at work. I felt that way in Europe as well. Now it's been so absorbed as a vocabulary. And um, I, I want to go back a second to what uh, Mark mentioned about, you know, the hands. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's it's really interesting to, to think of his legacy in, in these other specific ways, um, how people move. For example, um, Bob was one of the first people, if not the first in the in the uh, in the theater, um, to bring dance into theater. Now it had already been done in the visual arts world, for example, with work of Dick Higgins, who worked with a lot of dancers and performance scores. But Bob brought, brought um, dancers uh, into um, work. He also, I think, is a significant figure in, um, and someone else mentioned this also just briefly, um, in showing or unifying the two different lines of performance history, one coming from the visual arts and one coming from theater. That's really significant. Um, it was very unusual, um, uh, uh, except from the handful of people in, uh, in say, the 70s. So Bob's work is so spread. To go back to Maria's point, I'm fortunate enough to see a lot of the work 
over the years because of seeing it in Europe. But for people seeing it here, um, there, there's in New York, uh, it, it's it's very difficult because it spread so much, not only all over Europe, but maybe parts of Asia, different parts of Europe, east and west, um, and also in Latin America, and maybe in Brazil or someplace. Um, so it's difficult. But when you, if you can see the spread of material, not only is there his influence of what he did in theater and say in opera, but you know, I recently saw an installation of his, um, and that's seen by many, many international uh, audiences. It was at, I think it was at the Architecture Biennale, or one of the ones in recent years in Venice. I've also seen his glass um, sculptures um, in Venice. These are kinds of things that you don't really see here. So the influence is not only just what it is with um, theater people or just here in New York, it's much more worldwide and it's harder to measure. But, but to go back to that point about the hands, I wanted to say, of course, I've always been interested in his use of hands. Um, but in more recent years, I became interested in um, thinking about the use of the neck. Um, mm. Uh, he did a, 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 a an installation in, of owls in uh, the, at the Villa Panza in Varese in Italy, and I saw this um, in in recent years. And I remember uh, when I uh, was talking to Bob after uh, he performed Crab's Last Tape in New Jersey. Um, somehow we got onto this topic, and he was talking about how animals influence his way of acting so much. And of course, his work has a kind of bestiary in it. I mean, no one has used so many animals and climate and weather and so on as, as Wilson. But I, then I did some research on the owl. And the owl is probably the one animal that can um, turn its neck so much. And if you think about the actors and the use of the neck in his performances, it's really outstanding. Nobody does that. So there, there are just so many different things, like we're, really where wherever you look, it's the fa it's also the use of the face. Mm -hmm. Most uh, American productions do not use the face that much because people don't want to look so, you know, um, uh, angry or wrinkled or whatever. Um, but the but the Russian actors, the Japanese actors, and even the German actors, they have so much more of the face. So these legacies and uh, these uh, different techniques and ways of working are just spread all around the world. And they go beyond what somebody might do in New York or how can we measure this? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Bonnie. And uh, uh, Marcus, um, for seven years, you have brought out the um, Brecht yearbook. You are the president of the Brecht Society. Um, and some people argue since Brecht, uh, Wilson is the biggest, largest innovator. We, of course, now see also the work of Milo Rao, and we will see where it goes. But I would agree that way Stefan Brecht was part of his, uh, Thomas Groff Birch wrote the first book. Um, how do you look at the work of Bob Wilson when it comes uh, to legacy? So I look at Bob Wilson's work from a very isolated and insulated place. Since I've been a professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa since 2001, out of a faculty of more than a dozen uh, professors, I've been the only person who has taught and shown any interest uh, in, uh, in Wilson's work, um, with the exception perhaps of two faculty members who are in dance. Um, so it's always deeply frustrating for me, uh, I mean, to just see that there isn't much of a legacy with regard to perhaps uh, theater <laughs> faculty members that are not, um, you know, that don't have any kind of Europe European uh, background or experience and are not that familiar with the theater scene on the East Coast. Um, but if I would have to define what I consider um, uh, the legacy of, of Bob, it would be the ut ut utopian aspect of his mm -hmm. work, because I consider mm -hmm. his work a liberation from normative ways uh, and expectations with regard to the creation, performance, production, collaboration, financing, reception, aesthetics, and cross-disciplinary interlinkage of theater, uh, and of course the implication this liberation should have for humanity and society at large. So this is, this is a very comprehensive, uh, I don't know, definition of, of legacy, but, but I think the, uh, 
I think Bob's work has been so innovative and bold and really kind of radical in so many different ways. It's just really kind of difficult to sum up, you know, his legacy in just one or two sentences. Mm -hmm. But but the but the the major challenge, of course, is um, to, I mean, who apart from uh, certain, I don't know, but, but don't like the word very much, but, like, but kind of elites in our field that have access to his work, can travel to international theater festivals uh, to see his theater productions, or, you know, if you're lucky to live in places like Berlin or Paris or New York, where it's relatively easy to, to, uh, to, to see his productions, I think the communication of this legacy beyond i mean that's the problem of course with theater it is so it's always site specific um but to to and i think it's our responsibility also as uh, you know people academics in the field so to speak to to make sure that this legacy is better known and 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 spreads kind of outside our circles um Talking about Brecht, uh, Brecht, um, of course, you know, had his big theory of epic theater, the alienation, the Verfremdungseffekt, uh, the little organon. I remember in high school, I had to take tests, uh, compare Aristotle and Brecht. We had to learn it. You know, and then we learned something, or at least we thought, um, what will, what do you think? Are we all in the university, the teaching business, in the education, the transfer of knowledge? And Tadashi has this a little sign behind him he says knowledge is power and he says people should be more knowledgeable mm -hmm. <laughs> what will be taught what can be taught how is it already adapted or could be adapted i know maria had a uh, in her Rutledge book uh, exercises they forced her to do it uh, and you didn't really want it but what do you think is uh, uh, his works his what will be there what will be taught what will survive what uh, how will it be adapted Is that a question to everyone on the Everybody, floor? yeah, everybody. <laughs> Can I jump in then? Yeah. I think we might have to reformulate this uh, question in, in, a, in a more sociological way, i.e. it's different groups of different peoples in different cultures who will take from all the different aspects of Wilson's multiple work what they most need for themselves, for their development as artists, as people, as parts of humanity in time and place. We can't, I don't think, make this an abstraction about all humanity. Bonnie was pointing out the various different aspects and, of course, the, the importance of the visual art, of the artistic, of the art world in Wilson, the dance world in Wilson, the theatre training world in Wilson, the aesthetics and, and the kind of... I agree absolutely with, 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 with Mark. It's essential to come again and again back to the questions of the aesthetics because everything is articulated fundamentally through those aesthetics and then it's a matter of working out what, where, when, how. But the sheer diversity, lighting designers can learn from, from Robert Wilson. Uh, lighting, the, Stanislavski, on whom I wrote a book, surprisingly to everybody's great astonishment, um, said he was the first lighting designer, which I discovered from working on the Russian archives. He said that the light, lightest were artists. They couldn't just be technicians. Now, if Robert Wilson can come and show the world what really you can do, what Stanislavski was dreaming of doing with light um, and couldn't technologically achieve it. But the idea was there. Wilson has fulfilled it. He's made it concrete and manifested it in extremely clear material terms. But it, you know, it would affect some lighters. Some of that legacy would be protected by the lighting designers. It will depend again on the group. Some of them will protect it from the dance perspective. It's amazing. I know this from being an editor of a journal. I have asked for years for articles from dancers. And despite all this cross-disciplinary work that we do, dancers still stay in dance. They keep forgetting that spoken theater is also dance. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Mark, what comes to your mind? Yeah, um, I'm, it's a good question. I'm grateful for it. Um, you know, from one perspective, uh, Wilson is a professor's dream because there's so much on video 
Um, I was eavesdropping on the previous panel about the archive. There's this unbelievable resource there um, that could support um, the teaching of his work and the dissemination of his work through various curricula. Um, but as I found in teaching his work um, and hoping that students would watch a three or four hour video, um, it's very uh, challenging to figure out a way to um, impart in the classroom the importance of, of taking time with the work. Um, when you obviously see the production live, you are um, habituated into the discipline of spending time with the work. Um, and in uh, the, the structures of a classroom or the structures of a syllabus, um, it's hard to translate that. And I would just say the other aspect of it is, um, uh, you know, it's not just the scale of the work that is um, uh, hard to um, communicate in the kind of shrunken context uh, of the classroom, um, but other aspects of, of the live performance, the air above the actors' heads uh, on stage, which is as important as anything that is occupying space and or the actors themselves uh the way the stage is framed um not just what's inside the frame um the fact that so much is invisible to the spectator what is behind the two dimensionality uh of the performance is as wilson himself has said as important to him as what's on the surface of the performance. All of that, it's very abstract. It's even harder to um, talk about when all you have is a video or all you have are, are other people's accounts of those performances. Um, could I say something about that? Um, one of the things is, is just the problem of um, education. Even though everybody talks about interdisciplinarity, um, you wouldn't necessarily study Bob's work in an art department or a dance department. Um, and also, uh, people are not trained in multiple forms as arts critics. So in some ways, the work is stifled by um, not crossing over to these different departments and different student populations, but also, um, uh, of course, Maria's book is an exception, but uh, the majority of books um, of Bob's work have been really art books, and they're difficult to teach from. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so so it's the lack of a kind of mm -hmm. you know, textual material that that one could use um, in a classroom situation. So there there are just all these different uh, problems with the vocabularies and um, and the, and the and the division between different departments. So that's why I go back to the point I said, where, where people around the world and on a global scale see his work. So we can't account for somebody in, you know, Estonia who saw his uh, Arvo Part piece, or somebody who saw the glass in, you know, in Venice, or somebody who saw something in Berlin. It's really hard to move from, from, uh, you know, from New York because, you know, vocabularies um, you know, travel. Uh, to so many different parts of the world. It's not that his legacy is just in New York. It's hard to measure now. Um, but I think the lack of teaching materials that you could actually bring to the classroom is a, is a, is a problem in disseminating the work. Bonnie, I, can I speak a little bit? I said, don't, don't want to... No. It's just an immediate response. In terms of, I mean, I'm a pedagogue, I teach, I, this is my, my, my path in life. And um, I was doing interdisciplinary work 50 years ago. I mean, the theatre people didn't want to know me because I wasn't doing theatre. The other departments didn't want to know me because I wasn't doing sociology. But, you know, I was doing it all. I, I made myself actually study and learn these various aspects of interdisciplinary crossing so that I knew what I was talking about. But it's a hard, hard road, and most people don't want to follow it 
particularly when universities, or well, you know, they don't encourage it enough. It always boils down to people fighting over money. So if you're going to do an interdisciplinary course, who gets paid what? It's actually, I find, quite disgusting. There should be something much bigger in the university, some kind of nobility of spirit and soul. I don't know how else to put it. That yeah. allows for generous approach to, to work. So this is why I fall back on the idea that maybe we shouldn't be too, too worried because each society, each culture will retain from Wilson what it wants, what it needs and how it can best use it and how it can best maybe use it also as inspiration for something else that is theirs but behind it stands a historical shadow called Wilson. Yeah. Um, as a question, let's come to Bob Wilson's Watermill Center. Um, he had a colder reception, I think, in America of his work than perhaps in France or Germany, um, less frequently shown, as you all pointed out. Instead of being bitter or being in exile like a man Ray, he said, I'm going to create a watermill center. Uh, work in nature, but I'm going to do based in my country. Now, for 25 years, um, almost every year, 50, 100 students went through. He created his own free university in a way uh, Joseph Beuys uh, imagined uh, uh, educational transfer of knowledge outside institutions. Um, do you think that the knowledge actually is and will be uh, uh, the Watermill Center? His legacy uh, is contained in there like in a box and it will have take on a different form like a, a spaceship out there in long island um that um is uh, will be will be taking people to to uh, undiscovered space i mean i can just jump in very quickly and say that um i mean the way you describe watermill um points to the uh, legacy that we could imagine emanating from Watermill, and that is the value of collaboration, the value of these encounters, the people who are gathered together um, there, uh, and the people that are gathered together in uh, each production that he does. Um, I mean, many people, starting with Larry Shire, have written about how important collaboration uh, has been over the years uh, from the very beginning uh, for Wilson, um, and not just collaboration of individuals, but collaboration of different aesthetics and different um, uh, artistic disciplines. Um, you know, it was fascinating for me to learn that Anna Mendieta was in um, uh, the uh, Iowa production of Deaf Man Glance. Um, more well-known collaborations like Jack Smith's um, uh, follow from that. Um, at Watermill, there's a framed um, page from M Meredith Monk's score for Our Lady of Late uh, in one of the rooms. I mean, that kind of openness or receptivity to other artists that Watermill embodies, uh, I think, reminds us that that receptivity to other um, uh, aesthetics and other uh, collaborators and artists has always been fundamental to uh, to his work. But if I can jump in just for a second, I, I would say that, um, you know, the legacy is not just about aesthetics, it's about an ethos. And even if someone has never seen a production or an installation uh, by Bob or seen visual art, but just let's, has, let's say participated in the Watermill Summer Program will take something away from that experience um, that may be, you know, that may shape that uh, person's future artistic career without necessarily based on, you know, closely examining uh, Bob's aesthetics. I think b because his legacy in that regard is so broad, and I think M Maria used the word inspiration earlier. I mean, I, I think there, there's something about that aspect of Bob that is, that is really, really key. Uh, disregarding necessarily if you know uh, if you if, if, you, if you've seen specific or particular productions could I just quickly jump in I agree totally with you I agree totally about this with you but I wasn't talking about aesthetics as something you kind of sit on and analyze and hug it you know it's I see it in a much bigger sense 
in the sense of being part of an ethos which is being transmitted. And I think this is one of the crucial roles played by the Watermill Centre, is the invitation of people from abroad, so many different countries, so many different races, so many different religions, all working together under the auspices of, of, the, of, of Watermill. And they will go back and they will be inspired and they will have re received something from this experience and they can build on it within their own cultural space. That is part of legacy, the continual mm. building and the continual memory, because part of legacy is memory, how people remember. It's like dancers passing on movement from dancer to dancer. And it's the same kind of thing, really, when we talk about, well, as it is at least in my mind, when we talk about impact. It doesn't have to be a massive impact. It can be the impact of one person teaching another person, teaching another person down the line, very much like Stanislavski's history, in fact, of all those masses of people with whom he worked, and they were much huger than anyone ever realized. They all continued their work in their own respective way, mm. from their own respective point of view and understanding of what they did with the master. And I think this is what's going to be very important for Robert Wilson. Mm. Yeah, I, my, my, um, I would jump in a little bit and maybe this is uh, a bit different from uh, what we are about the issue of the watermill center itself, but I think that, um, Living in Japan, the, the, the major, I mean, as Maria was saying that we, each culture, each cultures or each, every culture has to, you can take whatever they need from Robert Wilson. But at the moment, I think it's the, the problem is the, uh, that, that the theater is losing the faith. I mean, the people are losing faith in theater. I mean, the theater communication itself. Everything is digital and everything is politicized. Everything is relativized. You can do anything you want and you don't, there is no legacy. You don't have to transmit anything from anybody. Kind of a nihilism is here, right here. And, and, and I totally agree with Bonnie. But we're talking about the, uh, the, the gestures of the hands. Uh, and and in, in my talk, I introduced Suzuki Tadashi's, uh, I, uh, you know, the praise of Robert Wilson. He was, he said the fingers, fingers, live fingers matters. Yes. And in the fiction, it's, it's live fingers matters. And that is the basic, I think we really have to work towards, I mean, in, in, in the context of education or in the context of uh, archiving and everything, we really have to keep saying or keep staying, uh, you know, keep uh, retaining the faith in theatrical communication. We've been doing it since the, doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, been doing it from the ancient Greek days doesn't really mean anything to the younger people because they believe that digital communication is everything, you see? So, I, I mean, that's, that's the given. So the fingers matter, it's in the live theater. And I think that that's the face in live performance is, is the major, I mean, it's not, of course, only Robert Wilson, but he is the one, he knows the power of the finger being lighted in the theater in front of 2,000 uh, 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 audience members. Mm -hmm. um, we're coming a little bit closer also to, to, to the end of our panel. If I could ask you to name one production of Wilson that mm -hmm. was fundamental to you to see that changed something uh, in you or maybe your own work. What production was it and uh, uh, why? Maybe Mark, I don't know, this, what, we start with you. I hate always being the one to go first. Um, <laughs> yes. uh, I mean, I mean, uh, well, actually, I will. Um, we haven't talked that much about, at least on this panel, about um, Wilson's so-called chamber works, um, and uh, um, perhaps in the U.S., um, his Hamlet machine is the best known of those. Um, but it's um, uh, the well, the chamber works in general help me think about even the grand works as being chamber sized um, from one perspective. Um, but the um, smaller chamber piece that stays with me the most is um, his version of Malady of Death, 
um, the Marguerite de Ross um, text uh, that he staged. Um, uh, I saw it in uh, Berlin, but I believe it has been in various other um, cities uh, as well with different casts, of course, over the years. And um, something about that uh, two-person uh, work distilled um, uh, so much about his aesthetic. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in the Duras text, um, uh, which I didn't know at the time that I saw it, um, Duras imagined, it's a prose work, but she imagines a uh, staging of it years before Wilson, of course. Um, and she says the way she would like to see it done is if the the two characters who are a couple um, are speaking to each other in separate rooms um, and something about that distance um, uh, crystallizes their troubled intimacy. Um, but it's so it's detachment, but it's also quite intimate, quite passionate, despite that impediment. And that I think is um, a lesson that you see demonstrated in so much of Wilson's uh, work as he stages other kinds of passion. Thank you. Marcus. Um. So I would say I'm probably not the uh, only, one, uh, only one in my generation uh, who would probably kind of consider uh, Hamlet Machine the, the kind of decisive early uh, impactful Wilson experience. I think for a number of reasons, you know, I mean, I was kind of 22, 23 years old, kind of when I kind of saw it. Um, and, and it had a particular resonance with regard to, I mean, that was kind of, of course, several years before the war came down, but it resonated in a way, I mean, that that production really kind of stayed with me for years. I mean, it's still kind of, I mean, in many ways, that's still kind of the driving factor, probably why I'm kind of involved in in the symposium. I mean, Hamilton Machine is, you know, has remained this eternal question mark. Yeah. Uh, not, you know, what is it? <laughs> And and just to see someone, I don't know, I don't want to be too, too academic here, but really kind of this kind of structuralist taking apart of, you know, uh, theatrical science systems, whether it's a, a, a text that runs in a linear fashion through the repetition of the same choreography that is kind of turned around gradually after each repetition and just the realization that a, a specific blocked physical gesture or movement, every time it's repeated and paired with a different text, then also means something completely different and becomes a different sign. I mean, it's, it's still to me the most interesting Brechtin Lehrstück almost about the functioning of theatrical language on, on, on stage. And it's so clearly pre constructed and deconstructed at the same time. I, mm. I, I, and at the same time, of course, you have all these mysterious figures that appear on stage. They're so carefully crafted and designed and therefore even more mysterious. I mean, that's, that's the other thing, you know, talking about kind of theater of images or theater of visions, the, 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 the precision with which the choreography, the blocking, the sound design, the, the, but also the, the way the characters actually kind of move, the precision with which that is conceived. So these, these images and sounds also stayed so clearly in my mind because of their precision while at the same time remaining a mystery with regard to their intended significance. And so, yeah. but I have to say at the same time, it does resonate with, you know, the recent history of, uh, you know, um, Eastern Europe, it's all of these elements are there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're very, um, on one hand, very visceral, on the other hand, still remaining abstract and poetic. And I, I don't know, that's Incredible, the, best, yeah. the best way I can kind of explain it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Tadashi, what was meaningful for you? Or which Bob well, work did you see? Well, personally, actually, the uh, the the best was the, actually, I, the, 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 uh, the, the lecture on nothing that he did uh, 
2019 in Japan. He was like 80 years old. This is this act as an, an actor, performer that was perfect. And how um, the theater can be larger than life, uh, you know. Uh, and he he was his in, uh, concentration intensity in acting was great. But historically speaking, I think we again this Hamlet machine was a kind of a shedding uh, point for the Japanese theater people and intellectuals because everybody was taken away by Heiner Murat, not Robert Wilson. People were saying that we don't need Robert Wilson anymore, but we need Heiner Murat. And that was like in the 1990s and, and we, you know, and we went into the legislature in East Germany and the European in the deeper uh, 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 layers of the U European theater, but we, many of us just sort of forgot about who you know, forgot about the word Robert Wilson. And I think we, I should really have to be reviving as, as the Marcus was saying what he did with the text. And, and that still is very interesting and uh, as directors should really pursue how, how to construct the, uh, the, the performative uh, side of the, the thing that the Hamlet machine was, 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 was able to be performed because of Robert Wilson. Not, not, not vice versa. So I think the Hamlet machine should be, uh, should be remembered, really. Uh, yeah. uh, Thank you. Thank you. Maria, what for you, or maybe what moment in that production? God, I can't think of one. I immediately see seven. Einstein blew my mind away in 1976. Hamlet machine blew my brain away, whatever, many years later. Um, I have a particular interest, perhaps, uh, because of my accrued knowledge. I've seen more than 40 productions live of Robert Wilson, so I can now say, well, maybe I can say the following, that within that context of seeing 40-plus productions live of Wilson all over the world, I've made huge efforts sometimes. My daughter used to say, no wonder we have no money, Mummy. You're always running off to see Robert Wilson's work on an aeroplane. <laughs> but jokes aside... I think one of the big things, I'm particularly interested in Robert Wilson's work in opera, really particularly mm. interested. All forms of his music theatre interest me. I loved very much um, Wojciech, for example. But I think in the grand opera, in the kind of opera that is not necessarily so grand, because Wilson in many ways makes it very accessible and much more back to its popular roots, if I may say, unless that's a real myth on the side of Italians. But um, Madame Butterfly, the use of music, the stillness, the silence of the body, the playing of the instruments, the way in which the color sustains the emotion, the quietness of the emotion, it's had an enormous impact all over Europe, Madame Butterfly. I know you haven't seen it in the United States, but it's had so many revivals. And as Robert Wilson is going back to Paris soon to rework another round of Madame Butterfly. It, 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 it can't just be because Madame Butterfly is Puccini and Puccini blah, blah. I think it's got a lot to do with how that combination of color of enormously incredible color, which is quiet, the quietness and the grace, a kind of a spiritual grace that falls and descends at the end of Act Two. I think that touches people very deeply, particularly in today's world, particularly into this uh, world of the digital world that, that um, Professor Rutina was talking about. People still need hope, and in some ways, that faith that we saw in Madame Butterfly and in the central character whose name is given to the production still affects people. I've seen young people sit and watch that opera, not just oldies like myself. Amazing. Yeah. Bonnie, for closing. I'm not sure if I have a, a favorite um production i you know i the first one i saw was 1973 the life and times of joseph stalin and i probably stayed till one o'clock in the morning i think it was started at seven um and uh it took me a while to really get into wilson but you know over these decades starting with 
uh, the theater of images in 1975. I've written about Wilson in every uh, um, book of essays that I have in the, the last one coming out in 21. So he's continued uh, um, to occupy my thoughts as I see more and more work, most of it in Europe and whatever else is in New York. Um, what, what interests me about it is the kinds of um, legacies that he leaves and what he's part of. For example, I remember seeing a, a production of a Peleus uh, by Ruth Berghaus in Berlin some years ago. I'm sorry I never saw more of her work because I could see how she influenced Wilson. And Wilson, uh, you know, knew her. Um, I, I'm in, besides the vocabularies and things we talked about, I'm interested in the, the kinds of things that appear in his different productions. For example, the idea of the visual book. I'm interested in his uh, performance and drawing, that kind of legacy, the, symbol, the legacy of symbolism, the ecology. Uh, there's so many topics that are yet to be really fully written about and more books. Mm. I mean, perhaps Mark can answer whether the, end, uh, the students at Yale will go to the archive um, or who will go there and produce these new books because he has created so many legacies, even the legacy of the archive, the archive of the world texts and images. I feel that Wilson has not gotten his due because he's not considered a political artist. It's just simple. The Village Voice always gave him bad reviews. Um, they did not support him. And even now, with all the conferences that people are doing on ecology, on uh, on the archive, on this and that, theatricality, the, the topics not are, Robert Wilson is not written about in topics. Mm -hmm. It all has to do with the politics. People don't know how to deal with spirituality. They don't know how to deal with beauty. Um, you know, so there, there's a lot of dynamics and things involved. But I'll just say also one thing. Um, you might be interested in this because so many people talked of uh, Hamlet Machine. Um, I saw the rehearsals of Hamlet Machine and the, the dramaturg was staying in my apartment and Heiner Mueller was living across the street. And I, so I went to them and one day uh, Wilson uh, said to me, what, what do you think of, of this? And I said something and he actually... Uh, was very good about it. It was a kind of criticism. I said that all the male scenes or Hamlet are up front um, and close to the audience, and they're treated as a kind of existential crisis. And the scenes of Ophelia and the women are in the back of the stage, and they're treated as hysteria. And he actually, you know, kind of listened. He said, "Well, thank you for saying that," you know, mm -hmm. and. Um, and, and and it was interesting because uh, I wouldn't really criticize Wilson's work, but it was it was clear about that, and he 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 just, he listened. But I but I did see the you know the uh, the, the rehearsals for that, and and spent a lot. What, of time. Even if you don't want to say it, if someone puts a kind of what what stays in your mind as a as a moment. Well, recent productions, I like Shakespeare sonnets very much. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. saw that, I That's guess, it. here. But also what stays in my mind, I've seen all of the uh, the uh, Einstein on the Beach, the original, and also all the revivals in New York. What's, what's interesting to me is the difference in the audience. Everybody was like stone silent in 1976. Mm -hmm. But by the time as we get closer and closer to our time, people laugh. And they, and they take the, they take it in an entirely different way. No one knows what to do with the silence, or they can't sit through it. And mm -hmm. so it's very disconcerting to uh, to see the production in that way. Uh, but I didn't love Einstein and the Beach. I wasn't really into the spirituality um, issue, and it was a problem. But um, I, I of recent productions, I liked the Three Penny Opera very much. I had some correspondence with uh, Wilson about uh, the Isabelle Huppert. Um, Mary said what she said, which I saw in Paris, because it was interesting that she worked really hard and she did such a good job, but that she was not a dancer. So we had questions going back and forth. I said, I noticed you use light in a different way in this production. So, you know, there, there, there are other things that interest me at this stage after yeah. all these um, kind yeah. of decades. And also seeing the glass. I'm going to go to Venice in the fall and he has an exhibition uh, Murano glass, you the know, enemies, that's yeah. really unknown here. No, yeah. we should see all more of it, and and, and I hope this conference is a is a, a contribution, you know, towards his reception, uh, highlighting it, 
Uh, Mark is also a Whistler Siegel Center. We will put out an academic journal, peer reviewed, a yearbook with work uh, about the work of Robert Wilson, which we, of course, will open to all scholars globally and hopefully also participant of the conference. Um, we'll continue to participate. The papers will be published next year, without the fall, we think we will have it um, all together. In closing, of course, thank you all um, for participating. It's impossible in such a short time as such uh, five brilliant scholars to even cover a small drop of the ocean um, of Wilson. But the great Andre Wirt said, um, if theater is interesting, it's interesting because it's a model, and it's a model for something. Mm. It exists on the stage. It could resist in life. And I think Wilson's work, his watermill center, and what happens on stage, the unique collaboration, the workshops, people from all walks of life, the professions, his love towards the art and community. He spoke about that, the idea that life is about experience and not meaning and that we have to collaborate and we have to gather. He said uh, in the talk, he said the reason for theater is to come together and experience a moment and theater can do that and others can it cannot be television it will not be the movies and 360 um artwork but it's something very very um, um meaningful in it and i think he showed us something as a fellow human being in the 20s and 21st century of what art can be how can it influence our life how it can create meaning tell us where we come from show us where we are and give us an idea how the future might be and make us feel at home and with it so thank you all so much tomorrow hopefully if our technical works goes uh, well and inusha did a great job in the conference here juggling everything with how around who we would like to thank for being our streamer we had a new software obs on it and but i think it worked very well tomorrow afternoon we will be at the watermill center and we will have some talks there starting at 2 p.m. And it will be the closing of the conference. Bob will be there and we put it in that unholy month of August. So Bob could come to us and we could see him and we're going to celebrate the Watermill Center, his life, Bob's life at work and the opening of the archive, which is, as we learned from Clipper, still a work in progress. So, so is our life. So is works for Bob's work. So thank you, everybody, from uh, joining us from London and Tokyo and from New York and uh, all the places. So uh, thank you very much. And to everybody who's in the room uh, at the Siegel Center, we're going to have a little reception and we're going to uh, raise a glass uh, for Bob, uh, for his world, his vision, his watermill center, his incredible work of over 400 productions. And, um, and I hope to see you all again at the Siegel Center online or one day in life. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.